Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman, and I'm the Marketing Director here at AAEES. We're happy to be here today with Professor Arthur, who is the President-Elect of the Academy and also the Deputy Chair of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health in the UK. Dan will be discussing a case study of sustainable development using climate insurance to promote fisheries management in the Caribbean. Before we get started, I just want to mention that you'll be able to message your questions at the end of the presentation. And also, Dan said it's okay if you if you don't understand something or you just want to jump in, you can go to the attendee chat during the presentation and he'll do his best to answer that question as he goes along. Um, otherwise, you can do it after the presentation. And then at the end, we'll have Dan's email address on the last slide so you can email him directly with any questions you might have. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, Dan. Thank you for joining us today. We're ready when you are. Thank you, Marissa. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's it's strange to be staring at the picture of myself while delivering a lecture, but you know that's the brave new world we're in. The way I have this set up is a little bit of a of a presentation within a presentation. So I'm going to try to hit kind of a synopsis at the beginning that paints the picture for where this topic fits in our Academy of Environmental Engineering and Science, um, where I see this as kind of the future of where we need to go as a profession. And then I'm going to have kind of the second part that's going to be unpacking this in the Caribbean. So I'm going to actually read through this first slide because it's got a lot of important concepts. It's, it's dense on text, but it's a useful first slide. So we're going to be talking about the Caribbean Ocean and Aquaculture Sustainability Facility. And one of the things that you'll notice I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my webcam and come back on and off a little bit so that you can get a slightly bigger screen, particularly as we're looking through this text. So one of the things that we're looking at today is this concept of build back better. The idea is to leverage the regular occurrence of disasters to improve the future design and operation of complex systems. Today, I'm going to be specifically giving us the example of marine capture fisheries but this could apply to sea level rise in Miami, Florida, or the occurrence of wildfires in California, or the lack of water in Atlanta, or hurricanes in Houston, Texas. So when we're thinking about this as environmental engineers and scientists, think about the idea that we're not just interested in providing a service, we're interested in providing a secure service that stands up to disasters. So this presentation is going to describe why and how an insurance scheme for the Caribbean fisheries was developed. And I'm going to suggest that this is a roadmap for how we want to, how we can and should use climate insurance and other financial instruments to promote improvements in complex systems as part of achieving sustainable development. I'm going to propose that this is the way we do environmental engineering and science in the future. For those of you that like to follow people on Twitter who like to kind of track along online, I have posted JPEGs of all of my slides on my Twitter feed. So if you look up at Daniel Other on Twitter, you'll find my Twitter post and you'll find JPEGs of all my slides. If you'd like to interact with me there online on Twitter, I'd appreciate it if you'd use the hashtag Coast. If you're a non-Twitter person, no big deal. You don't have to be enrolled. You don't have to be a member of Twitter to read Twitter. It's a microblog, right? So you can just simply read somebody's feed without being a member. If you're more into the old-fashioned websites, I have a WordPress site that talks about coast fishery. So you can get more information on this presentation there. All right, let's get into what we're going to talk about first. I'm going to highlight three learning objectives, right? I'm going to try to convince you that sustainable development includes more than meeting immediate physiological needs. Number two, I'm gonna to try to convince you that environmental design includes the concept of build back better. And number three, I'm gonna argue that the way we teach, the way we practice, the way we promote policy must truly leverage as concept of convergence research. And I'm gonna explain what that term is and I'm going to argue that we need to be producing what I'm going to call V-shaped professionals. And I'm going to explain the difference between I and T and V-shaped professionals, a term that I've coined relatively recently. 
All right, so if we think about sustainable development and where does it come from, the classic definition from 1987 comes from what is called Our Common Future, a report that was chaired by Brundtland, the former prime minister of Norway. And this definition is one that pretty much every student can cite. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The title of the report is Our Common Future. Most people hang on the word future. They think about, let's not trash the planet for our children or our grandchildren. And that's certainly an important concept. But I would argue that the word need is as valuable, if not more valuable, for unpacking this definition. What do we mean by need? What is a need? Well, if we turn to the field of psychology, we discover something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This comes from the theory of human motivation. Why do people do the things they do? Well, first of all, we try to meet at the bottom of the pyramid physiological needs. We all need food and water and air and sex and a place for getting rid of waste. Right? These are things that we need physiologically. And once those basic needs are met, we start to explore higher level needs like safety and love and belonging. Now, there's lots of baggage and lots of bias in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Obviously, white male, 50 years ago, coming from a certain perspective and a certain culture. I'm not gonna argue whether this has got some bias and baggage. Of course it does. But it is a useful tool for thinking about, to a first order approximation, what motivates people. Yes, having food motivates people. Having clean water motivates people. But perhaps as important, if not even more important, it's not just food and water. It's the reliable access to affordable food and water. It's the security of those needs. And it doesn't take us too far to go to the idea of dirty and clean water and think about places like Houston, Texas, post-hurricane, right? The idea of developed disaster and back to develop means that we need to think about water, but not just water and not just water regulations, but water security. Do we have affordable, reliable access to water to support the lifestyles that we're choosing to adopt? That's a big difference than just having water. So if we think about this more broadly and we look at this diagram on the left, the idea is we are developing. Right? We are financially, socially, in partnerships, in peace, with people, with the environment we're developing. That's something we're on a trajectory to do. And as we're developing, we prepare for disasters. And when a disaster occurs, we respond to it. And then we have a period of recover. And then we get back into mitigation so that that disaster won't happen in the future. So development is interrupted by disasters. We have a car with a car wreck. We have health with health insurance. We have a home with homeowner's insurance. We understand that people's behaviors are related to their finance. And so over here is the gecko from Geico, which we think about in the context of insurance. And, and we realize that when people are dealing with development, their behaviors are modified. Their behaviors relate to their finance for disaster. If you lose some weight, your health insurance costs less. If you stop smoking, your life insurance costs less. If you're a better driver, your car insurance costs less. We realize in environmental engineering and science that finance nudges behaviors. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Charge a refund on a plastic bottle and people will recycle their bottles. We already know this. This is something that is part of who we are as environmental practitioners. But we haven't leveraged this yet in the climate space. There's an opportunity here for us to do more. And for us to be able to work in this space, we need to understand the global perspective. This is not a US issue. This is not a UK issue. This is not a, a have versus have not issue. This is a global issue. And globally, the players that are helping to drive this are the United Nations Environmental Program based in Nairobi and the United Nations Development Program based in New York. So if you'd like to understand more about how finance and climate and environment relate to behavior change and more sustainability, look at the activities by these organizations. In particular, if you're not familiar with, I encourage you to become familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
These are the things that are driving global development from 2015 to 2030. And they are not goals for those without. They are goals for all of us. A lot of us think about the United Nations and we think about the haves and the have-nots, those that, that have money, those that have privilege, and those that are lacking, those that have been left behind in some way. And we often think about development as something that we do to help others, to work with others. The sustainable development goals are fundamentally different. Us, developed world, and others, developing world, are linked together in one system, one framework. And when you look at these goals, you'll immediately see this. Yes, sure, there's zero hunger. And we might think, yeah, are you talking about the 800,000 or 800 million people that are hungry around the world? Yeah, I am. But I'm also talking about the fact that one in five Americans suffers an occurrence of hunger every year. One in five Americans has a day when they're not sure where their next meal is going to come from. America is a country that's hungry. America is a country with food insecurity. And how do we as environmental engineers and scientists address those issues? The SDGs are a fantastic way to bring a whole bunch of things together under a single umbrella. And I think that the way we do this is through convergence, right? Convergence research defined by the National Science Foundation is to solve compelling social problems by bringing disciplines together. And this is where I've defined I-shaped, T-shaped, and this new acronym, this idea of a V-shaped professional. We all understand I-shaped engineers, right? We, we drill down deep. We learn lots. We become very professionally competent in our field. And we appreciate T-shaped professionals, like those in finance that are interdisciplinary, that spread out their research and their education, their practice and their policy. But I'm arguing that we need to create a new type of professional. We need to do a V-shaped professional. Let's not blur what it is to be an engineer. Let's not blur what it is to be a scientist. Let's not blur what it is to be in finance. We don't want to indiscriminately blur disciplines. Instead, we want to intentionally create trajectories that bring disciplines together at interfaces to solve future problems. What does this look like in the case of finance and engineering? Well, it's the slide rule and the bridge combined with the financial statements of income and balance and cash flow. The finance engineer or finance scientist has to be comfortable working with financial models and physical models and move effortlessly between them. So I hope what I've convinced you of is the learning objectives that I wanted in this brief first part of my presentation. What I've done here is, is given you a little synopsis. I hope I've convinced you that sustainable development includes more than just meeting our immediate physiological needs. It also includes broader safety or the idea that your need is met over time at an affordable cost. I hope that I've convinced you that environmental design includes building back better, making things so that they do have security for the future. And I hope that I've convinced you that we need this V-shaped professional. We still need to be environmental scientists, environmental engineers, but we need to work together at the interface with other disciplines, particularly finance, to be able to nudge behaviors and to create resiliencies in our communities, both in the United States as well as around the world. So I'm going to transition a little bit. This is, this is now the second part of the talk. This is, this is the part where I'm going to unpack this case study of sustainable development. We're going to drill down into the sustainable development goals and specifically look at the interface of a couple of goals. People are hungry. Women are marginalized. Folks in developing countries don't have the best job opportunities. The climate is a force multiplier. It exacerbates all the above problems. And in particular, we're going to look at problems that occur in the oceans, life below water. This is a broad example of how we solve things in partnerships focused on peace and justice. This is the ultimate in diversity, equity, inclusion, because these partnerships are global in nature, tying together developed and developing communities under the sustainable development goals. So the presentation outline, what we're going to talk about. First of all, we're going to focus on convergence research. I'm going to argue for a specific and compelling problem. How can climate smart food security enhance community resilience? 
I'm going to talk about the integration of the disciplines of engineering and finance and diplomacy. The methods that I'm going to discuss are diplomatic and community-based participatory research. I'm going to talk about some results, giving you a historical setting and talking about the steps of CVPR. And then I'm going to conclude with a little bit of discussion. <clears throat> so if we look first at background, the overarching goal around the world, there are 60 million people who fish. There are 5 million vessels. Capture fisheries use more of the Earth's surface than farming. Let me restate that. Fishing on oceans uses more of the Earth's surface than all of our farming. We think of like the Midwest. We think of Brazil rainforest as huge areas of the Earth's surface used for food production. Fishing uses a larger fraction of the Earth's surface. And if we look at trends in fishing over time in this graph on the right showing years, decades, 1980 to 2010, and looking at three different trends, how much is overfished in orange, how much is sustainably fished above the white line, and how much is underfished, what we notice is that we are increasing our amount of unsustainable fishing. We are reducing our underfished areas. There are fewer and fewer places to capture fishing. And this is because climate change, population growth, and diets continue to exacerbate our demand for animal protein coming from the marine environment. In particular, if we focus on the Caribbean, we think about the small island developing states. There are about 300,000 fishers in a dozen plus countries spread throughout the Caribbean. And some things to think about when we're thinking about the economics and the social conditions, the environmental conditions in the Caribbean. This picture in the upper left is the typical art artisanal fisher, a fellow going out with a net catching fish for himself and his family and to make a little bit of money. You have to contrast that with mega resorts. These fishers are literally living in the shadows of destination vacation locations that developed people, citizens from developed countries come to. So there's a tremendous kind of dichotomy here between the haves and the have-nots. Those folks that are choosing to fish are a tremendous cultural and economic asset to their communities, and they're under tremendous pressure from the tourism industry. They're also in the lower right hand under tremendous pressure from illegal activities. The Caribbean is a corridor for the import of illegal substances into the United States. About 40% of the drug traffic into the United States flows through the Caribbean. This means that when the United States Department of State engages in Caribbean activities, a lot of what we're thinking about is less about development and more about interdiction, more about stopping the flow of drugs. So this project kind of turned that on its head. It's focusing on development, and we're really focused on that fissure in the upper left-hand picture. I'm going to talk about some methods, diplomacy methods and community-based participatory research methods. These are things that we are not very commonly using, particularly in environmental engineering, but even in environmental science. Diplomacy, defined in 2010 by a joint commission of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Royal Society in the UK, means that scientists working as diplomats work in three spaces. Number one, there are those of us who are scientists that are actually employed as diplomats. From 2014 to 2019, I carried a diplomatic passport. I was a special advisor to the Secretary of State, and my job was to negotiate on behalf of the United States this COAST project. There are diplomats promoting partnerships, right? Diplomacy for science. Think about this as the International Space Station, the Antarctic Treaty, uh, CERN in, the, in Europe, right? Things where diplomats help empower scientific activities. And then third, think about scientists building relationships, detente, the idea that Fulbright scholars travel to other countries, the idea that international meetings occur. This is the space where we as the Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists can make a big impact. We can build diplomatic relationships with other scientists and engineers in other countries. The second thing that I want to talk about is public diplomacy, right? So public diplomacy, defined in 2008, involve activities like listening, advocacy, 
cultural diplomacy, where you do exchanges, in particular, the exchange diplomacy of Fulbright, but also broadcast diplomacy, the voice of America. One of the things that's become very powerful in public diplomacy recently is what we call city diplomacy. The Rockefeller Foundation has promoted city to city engagement. Let's remove some of the, the, the kind of the overhead that comes from state actors. In other words, let's, let's cut out the, the diplomats working for the State Department and let's have mayors engage directly with other mayors. As we now have 50% of our global population living in cities, the political ability of mayors to address climate is increasing. And so mayors engaging directly with mayors in other cities is a tremendous tool in the public diplomacy space. The other tool that I want to talk about is community-based participatory research. This is super important for our field. CBPR comes out of a definition from the field of nursing. And if we look at these words on the left, I want to actually read through this. The purpose of CBPR, as created in a report published in Advanced Nursing Science, as requested by President Clinton, was to eliminate health disparities. In bold, CBPR is a method to deliver community-partnered interventions to reduce health disparities in racially and ethnically diverse minority populations. Eliminating gerrymandering and redlining is part of CBPR. Providing access to water and healthy food in communities that have food deserts or communities that have poor water quality is a part of CBPR. It is the future of environmental engineering and science when our objective is diversity, equity, inclusion, when our goal is to leave no one behind. And these bullets over here on the right are the tenets of how you do CBPR. You, well, let's talk through the ones in bold. You recognize the community as the unit of identity. Your client is not the individual. It's the group. It's the collective. As a professional, you're engaged in co-learning. You take a position of humility. You don't know more than your client, the customer. You don't understand all the details of their life. You're there to listen and learn as much as you are to share and teach. The idea is that it is cyclical and iterative and that the outcome is action. CBPR does not conclude with and more research needs to be done. CBPR concludes with, and this solution is what we want to invest in. CBPR requires a long-term commitment. You have to be willing to set aside all the biases that you bring into an engagement and focus on how you grow something up together for the long term. So I applied CBPR as a tool. Stage one was to identify stakeholders, collect background information, formulate a question. Stage two was planning. Come up with a hypothesis and an experimental approach. Agree on a timetable for deliverables. And then stage three was execution. I like to think about this as the magnifying glass to identify things. The plan, right, moving towards the future, and then the infinity symbol, that it's a never-ending process of sustainable development. This is a picture of me in the Caribbean. This is in St. Lucia, one of the countries that adopted this climate insurance that we put together. Next thing we're going to get into is some results, the historical setting, and then I'm going to talk about some of the details of creating this parametric insurance policy. Before I ever engaged in this, the Caribbean community had already done some work. In 2014, the Caribbean community had adopted the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy. If you're not familiar with the Caribbean community, think about it like the European community. It is a collection of countries that work together, right? So just like you've got common trade treaties in Europe, common uh, articulation for professionals, uh, common passports, common currency. In the Caribbean, there are a variety of different commonalities. In the Caribbean community, this is a trade and self-defense, self-protection agreement. And one of the things that's in this fishery policy in Article 5 is the importance of using best available scientific information in fisheries to make decisions. In other words, they want to be driven by science. And in Article 10, 
one of the things they agreed to is that they wanted to create environments that promoted activities, in particular to develop fish and aquaculture sectors, thinking about the social determinants of these sectors by using insurance as a way to make improvements. So it was into this background of the CCCFP that I was invited by Secretary Kerry, then the Secretary of State of the U.S. in 2014, as part of his standing up of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture to create COAST. So here's Secretary Kerry with Ambassador Nancy Stetson, who is the, the special representative for world food security, representing President Obama on the world stage for food. And this is our small office picture in the upper right hand side, right? So I was Secretary Stetson, or I was Ambassador Stetson's senior agricultural advisor. My job as a diplomat was to provide her with everything she needed to know on a technical standpoint to be able to do initiatives that addressed climate in the agricultural space. So CBPR stage one identifying, what did that include? Well, this is a complicated process. These are things that we did throughout 2015. In early January, we invited a variety of different uh, leaders from the Caribbean to come together for a meeting. And at that time, Deputy Secretary Anthony Blinken, who is now the current Secretary of State, was the first to announce COAST. He announced it at a meeting. You can see him in the lower right-hand side. He announced it at a meeting of all the prime ministers from throughout the Caribbean countries. In February, we held a briefing where Ambassador Stetson explained details of COAST to the ambassadors from Caribbean countries. And then throughout the rest of 2015, you see all the way up to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in November when President Obama announced COAST as a contribution to risk insurance initiatives that help vulnerable populations rebuild stronger after climate-related disasters. We spent an entire year developing this COAST concept so that President Obama could announce this in Paris as a way the United States was leveraging finance to achieve climate resilience. Now, across that year, one of the things we had to do was identify who was the audience. And we figured out that women who fish and own boats and have shore-based enterprises was an important audience to address in the Caribbean. We looked at the historical condition. We found that insurance was part of the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy. We figured out that most fishers in the Caribbean lacked insurance for their vessels, for their health, for their lives. And we created a research question. We asked the question, how does climate smart food security enhance climate resilience? You'll notice we did this by engaging with a number of different organizations. This chart here on the right, starting with the U.S. Department of State, which was founded in 1789, and extending all the way to the bottom, the Caribbean National Fisheries Organization just stood up in 2009. All of these organizations, CFAS, which is basically the NOAA of the U.K., the World Bank, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, and then as Caribbean-specific organizations stood up in the last 25 years. All of these groups were invited to be stakeholders. All of these groups were invited to give their view on what we should work on. And this audience, this group of stakeholders, came up with this identified audience of women, insurance, fishers, and climate resilience. We moved from stage one to stage two, right? Stage one is identifying and stage two is planning. Now let's talk through this complicated slide here. In blue, we propose to use parametric insurance. Parametric insurance disperses funds based on the occurrence of a predefined level of hazard and impact. Now I'm sure many of you are saying, okay, Dan, yeah, that, that sounds good, but what do you mean? Most of us are familiar with what's called indemnity insurance. I have a house. I know how much my house is worth. I buy an insurance policy for my house. A tree falls on my house. I get some estimates of the repair cost. I call my insurance agent. He or she comes out and takes a look at the damage. At some point in time, there's an adjustment made. At some point in time, I pay my deductible. At some point in time, a payment is made and I'm either paid ahead of time for the repair or I'm reimbursed after the fact. There is a lot of overhead time and cost in that transaction. 
How in the world do we apply that model to a boat that's only worth $2,000 in the Caribbean? It would never withstand the overhead time and cost. My half million dollar home, no big deal that I'm paying a couple thousand dollars a year on insurance. No big deal that it involves multiple people looking at things. My $2,000 boat, how would I ever get that indemnified? How would I ever get that adjusted after a damage? Parametric insurance escapes all those overhead costs involved in indemnification. Here's the way parametric insurance works. A policy is triggered on the basis of exceeding a pre-established trigger. When the wind speed is high enough, I know the trees are gonna be knocked over. So I don't insure your house for a tree falling. I issue you an insurance policy based on wind speed. If the winds are low enough, no trees fall. Your house isn't damaged. If the winds are high, trees get knocked over. So I give you a payment. So an insurance scheme in the Caribbean could be based on wind speed and storm surge coming from tropical cyclones. It could be based on ground shaking from earthquakes. It could be based on excess rainfall causing flooded. The idea is that you apply a hazard level to a predefined government exposure to produce a loss estimate. In other words, the government says, based on historical data, when a, when a hurricane has come through, it's cost us this much money. Insurance company says, okay, we can relate the magnitude of that hurricane to your amount of loss, and we can insure that. So just like you can have an insurance policy that's on your home based on how often trees fall and how much your home is worth, and you can create an actuarial model that indemnifies your home. We can create a parametric model that relates wind speed and storm surge to how much the fishing industry is damaged. And then we can set a payout to increase with the level of model loss. For engineers and scientists, this isn't a weird thing. The idea of I'm not worried about the real thing, I'm worried about a model of the real thing. I don't have a problem moving to that abstraction. And when I move to the model, it works great for the financer. They can easily assign values to the model. So the second stage of CBPR, planning, was to also look at the type of assets shown here in the chart on the left. There's the infrastructure that's on the shore. There's the gear and vessels. There's their livelihoods and lives, right? People die. People can't fish. Boats can get damaged. Ports can get damaged. We needed sources of information to create a model. This came from things like Google Earth. This came from databases maintained by NOAA. This came from models that we built custom as part of creating this insurance scheme. We collected local information. We got information from the Food and Agricultural Organization. We got emergency disaster management information. And we put this together in the model that's on the right. And here's the idea. As you move across damage shown on the x-axis, you increase the amount of payout on the y-axis. That first red arrow, a little bit of damage gets no payout. It's kind of like the one-year storm for flooding. Of course you're going to get some flooding. We're not going to give you a payout for that. We designed our insurance scheme to have an attachment to start paying out at the five-year period. When fissures have enough damage that it actually impacts them, when the likelihood of damage is a bad hit once every five years, then we're going to start the payout scheme. We have our next stage at 15 years, the 15-year storm. Then we have the final stage at the 30-year storm. So once every five years on average, once every 15 years on average, and once every 30 years on average, there'll be damage and you'll receive a payout. Now, for those of you that understand the way the five-year storm works and the 10-year the and the 100-year storm works, right? it's not that that a storm occurs once in 100 years. It's that that is the storm that is expected to occur that typically occurs with a period of once every 100 years. That storm can occur five years in a row. right? So when we design this insurance, we're taking a return period that's based on the typical storms. But this insurance scheme can trigger every single year if you get a storm that's bad enough to exceed the threshold. 
So just like a flood insurance that would be based on the five-year storm or the 15-year storm, this is an insurance policy that is based on the five-year tropical cyclone or the 15-year tropical cyclone. Now, stage three is that we hypothesized, or stage two, part three, was that we hypothesized that there was a mathematical model that would describe the annual loss due to business interruption from bad weather and the capital loss due to the loss of fishing gear and infrastructure. We put these two together into a single model because fishers can't go fishing when the waves are too high and the dock gets damaged when the waves are really high. And so we had to create a mathematical model that allowed the small damage from a storm with the massive damage from a hurricane all together in the same description. This is the first time anybody had ever linked mathematically in a model a storm with a hurricane. Storms and hurricanes are fundamentally different meteorological phenomenon. They behave in entirely different predictable fashions. So the way you model a hurricane and the way you model a storm are very different. This was the first time anybody had ever merged those together. And one of the things we identified is that we needed a full-time person to actually implement this. And so I moved from my position at the State Department to my position in a company in the Caribbean, the Caribbean Community uh, Risk Insurance Facility, or CRIF. And there I served as a project implementation coordinator and drove forward this development. And what we did was we created an insurance scheme. And this is the summary here. We first did this in St. Lucia. We've also done this in Grenada. And the table here shows what this cost and what we created. In 2015, for $50,000, we created a Caribbean basin-wide environmental scam on the existing extent of insurance. In 2016 to 2018, we continued to integrate the concept of coast insurance into a mutual company co-owned by all the Caribbean governments called CRIF, Segregated Portfolio Company, or CRIF SPC. 2018 is when CRIF hired me as a State Department employee to implement the rest of this project in collaboration with the World Bank. And so from 2017 through 2019, we actually convened stakeholders and wrote the insurance policy and created the mathematical model. The World Bank and CFES in the Caribbean, that's the NOAA version of the United Kingdom. CFES were instrumental in providing the technical expertise for this environmental effort. In 2018 and 2019, we put a half million US dollars to construct this model. And from 2019 through 2020, we funded a insurance cell in CRIF for two and a half million. We capitalized this insurance scheme. Now, right now, what that means is that there are about 10,000 fishers in these two countries that are covered by tropical cyclone and bad weather fishing insurance. There are 300,000 fishers throughout the Caribbean. So we've only, we're only covering 10,000 of 300,000 currently. There are plans underway to further capitalize this insurance scheme. Um, donations coming from a variety of different sources, including the United States. The concept here is that instead of putting money into after the fact repairing damage, the idea here is that you're putting money ahead of the time into an insurance scheme that will take care of the damage after the fact. So what does this look like? Well, when we executed this in 2017, the Caribbean suffered a series of very devastating hurricanes. And the leaders of the Caribbean came forward and said that they wanted the Caribbean to be known as the world's first climate smart zone the world's first place where development professionals would make investments, not in taking care of problems after the fact, but in reducing problems before they ever occur. This company, mutual company, CRIF, created as its strategic objective to create innovative and responsive products, particularly this Fisher's product. And then a number of Caribbean organizations, including CRIF and the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, this is essentially, think about this as, as like the, the Department of Natural Resources, right? This is the fisheries mechanism for the Caribbean created a memorandum of understanding where we're working together to establish climate resilient fisheries and aquaculture throughout the Caribbean. 
This relates to the United Nations disaster risk reduction model that was put forward in Hyogo and most recently Sendai. And this is where the concept of build back better comes from. In 2015, the Japanese government recommended the concept of build back better. The idea that you have substantial reductions in global disaster mortality, reducing the number of people impacted globally from disasters, reducing the impact to gross domestic product, reducing disruption to important infrastructure by substantially increasing the number of countries that have insurance, the number of countries that have plans for dealing with risk. The increasing the number of countries that are sharing data and that have ability to work together for telling their citizens about disasters as they're occurring, that have access to multi-hazard early warning systems. The idea here is how do we leverage all the fantastic scientific work with all the diplomatic partnerships to be able to make communities around the world more resilient as the climate continues to change? So I'm gonna conclude with a little bit of discussion and a little bit of comments on how this relates to design. And I hope I'm convincing you that this represents a fundamental new paradigm for how we operate as environmental professionals. Yes, we need to provide services to meet physiological needs. We need to build that water plant. We need to do that bioremediation. But society needs more from us. They need us to provide security. They need us to ensure the designs we put in place will not only meet the criteria we've selected in terms of certain water quality, certain environmental cleanup, but they'll meet them cost effectively and reliably into the future as the climate is changing. It's a new, it's a new paradigm for us in our design. It's not just that we've designed something to meet some criteria for today. It's that we've met the criteria that we're anticipating as the planet warms by two or three degrees centigrade. So did we hit our target? Remember, our goal was to use climate smart food security to enhance community resilience through convergence of engineering and science and finance and diplomacy. We worked on three different stages to identify the stakeholders, to plan solutions, and then to execute successes. And we had some milestones, and then what I would suggest are things we should think about for design improvements. And let's focus on that last column. When we design things as environmental engineers and scientists, it is imperative that we identify and include historically underrepresented stakeholders. In this case, specifically women in the fishery sector because they were fishers. They owned vessels. They owned shore-based infrastructure. We were addressing the issue of gender equity through insurance as part of sustainable development, as an environmental engineering and science initiative. In terms of planning, there is a recognition of professional responsibility for project implementation. We as environmental engineers and scientists need to get outside of our comfort zone of just doing engineering or science work and get into the uncomfortable space of policy and politics. In particular, in this project, I was working in international diplomacy, a very, very difficult space, particularly if you think about kind of presidential politics in the last five years, um, there was a lot of back and forth about how you would sell this message of resilience. I will tell you that Climate resilience and weather insurance sell very well, whether you're talking to more conservative politicians or more liberal politicians. Generally, policy space folks like the idea of spending small amounts of money early to take care of big problems later. And insurance is a way to do that. So there was a lot of policy appetite for this kind of project. In terms of design improvement with executing successes, the use of evidence-based policy and practice is what's gonna assure long-term success of this design. We are using state-of-the-art modeling to be able to predict what's going on in the fishery sector in the Caribbean. This, as these kinds of approaches are used other places, looking at climate change impacting sea level rise for Miami, Florida, or water availability in Atlanta, or floods in Houston, or wildfires in California, 
we as environmental engineers and scientists have an opportunity, and I would say an obligation, to lead in this space of creating these models that bring together the knowledge we have in science and engineering with the financial space where we can deal with problems before they arise. This project was recommended for a, uh, an, honor, uh, an honor award in environmental sustainability last year with the Academy's Excellence in Environmental Engineering and Science Competition. Uh, our whole team was grateful for that. And then this past year, the Society for the Environment in the UK uh, recommended this with a highly commended award for the Environmental Project of the Year. And so those were two nice kind of like, you know, cherries on top of the cake for getting some recognition of the leadership of this kind of project. But what I hope is that presentations like this inspire you to look for ways to get outside of your comfort zone as a scientist or an engineer, to lean into the policy and politics space, to realize that finance is something that we can do well as environmental professionals. And so just to summarize here, Coast, Caribbean Ocean and Aquaculture Sustainability Facility. My purpose was to convince you that the concept of Build Back Better, leveraging the regular occurrence of disasters, helps us improve the design and operation of complex systems. In this case, an example of marine capture fisheries. I hope I've convinced you of the why and the how this insurance scheme was created. And then I've convinced you of a roadmap of how we as environmental engineers, as scientists, working as V-shaped professionals, leaning into convergence research, can be able to promote sustainable development, local to global around the world. Those of you that would like to email me to get more details, there's the email address, daniel at other.org. Those of you that are following me on Twitter, check out that handle at Daniel Other. And there's other places to learn more about me if that's something of interest to you. Thanks so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay, now we're opening up for questions. Um, if you have a question, just type it in on the left-hand side of your screen where it says attendee chat and Dan will answer as many as he can. And as if you'd like to email him directly, what was that, Dan? I said I'll answer as many as I can, as best I can, right? So. Yeah, and you can also email him. Okay, let's see, any questions yet? Not yet. Well, maybe you'll get a flood of emails with questions. I'm happy for any of it. This is, some, I mean, this is a tough topic, right? This is outside, I mean, this is way beyond what we normally think of when we're doing environmental engineering and science. Um, when I delivered portions of this talk to different audiences as well as to, to students as, as part of the CAPI lecture, um, it really pushed them outside of their comfort zone, right? I mean, we're much more accustomed to the thinking about how do we design something or how do we measure something and then actually turning it into action. Um, that's, that's a little bit outside of what we're normally accustomed to. And, and I would argue that we're the ones who are best set for doing this. So I see uh, Kenneth Kraft, what was the most challenging part of navigating this topic? Um, well, so for me, Kenneth, it's working way outside of my comfort zone, right? See, I don't have training as a diplomat or as a policymaker. I don't have a PhD in economics um, or a bachelor's degree in, in foreign policy. I, I'm not an attorney. Um, and so creating policy, um, you know, it was a difficult space to get into. So I learned a lot. Uh, it was a little bit of like bull in the china shop, you know, kind of, you know, I would propose something and people would look at me like, okay, you're a scientist, aren't you? You're not a policymaker. So um, I would say that my recommendation to people is be bold uh, and, and lean in and try some of these. Um, it, is, it is an example of doing something that is a little bit different as an engineer and scientist. It is difficult to find ways to get these kinds of things funded. So, you know, students, I explain to them, you know, that's why Peace Corps and other activities like that can be there. Um, you know, for folks in consulting, there are some opportunities with USAID and others to work in this space. But I guarantee you, cities are going to be thinking about this as Miami floods, as Atlanta runs out of water, right? I mean, as, as forest fires burn in California, it is going to become less about could you provide a particular environmental service 
and more about can you reliably guarantee the environmental service over time? So that would be an encouragement I would offer. Um, Howard, pine of syrup, thank you so much. Melissa, hi, hi, yeah, hi, Melissa. Is there an example in the aftermath of a disaster of an actual outcome for an individual fisher? So it's good and bad, Melissa. No, there is not an actual example because they haven't had a bad enough storm in the past two years to trigger this insurance policy. There is a sister product that is in um, that, that is in Sub-Saharan Africa that actually looks at this for agriculture, particularly to try to empower farmers to not kill their livestock when their when their crop fails. So if the rainfall doesn't come and the cassava dries up. Uh, most farmers will start to sacrifice livestock. So there's an insurance scheme that as the cassava crop starts to fail, money is used to offset lost income so they don't sacrifice animals. Um, that has turned out to work very well. Uh, and so there are some precedents of where this is working. That is called the African Risk Capacity or ARC. Uh, and that is a, a food security around um, animal agriculture and crop agriculture. So I can point to some other examples, but that's kind of a, a clear one. Um, David said, is Coast set up to sustain itself with a mission that helps it fund? Absolutely, David. So, so CRIF is a mutual company owned by the Caribbean governments. Now, the U.S. government put $5 million into this initially, which paid for the technical assistance and provided two and a half million dollars of capital to initially capitalize the insurance policy. Um, that means we can retain some of the reinsurance costs ourselves and we don't have to pass those on in terms of uh, premium. Um, but, you know, that is kind of an ever growing market. But the concept here is that if you put money in ahead of time, you take care of the payouts of money afterwards. So, um, Lutheran World Relief, the International Red Cross. There are a number of organizations. In fact, even the Nature Conservancy considers this a fantastic way to leverage insurance to meet their long-term objectives. And so there's definitely an appetite from pots of money that historically have been spent on disaster recovery uh, to, be, to be invested in avoiding disaster ahead of time. Um, and we're still working on those. Um, can the insurance scheme stand up on its own without government sponsorship? Um, yes, it, it has operated the last two years without any further infusion of money. Uh, the stall is that the capital funds don't let us uh, retain enough of the reinsurance risk uh, to expand it beyond the initial 10,000 fishers. Um, I would argue that the U.S. spending $5 million to take care of 10,000 people uh, is a good investment of U.S. taxpayer money. Um, you can think about how far do you scale that when you're trying to get to 300,000 fishers and what that would cost. Uh, the African risk capacity for sub-Saharan Africa represented a 400 million pound investment by the British government. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is ultimately scales up to things that are in the tens to hundreds to, you know, billions of dollars, but these are all funds that are capital investments and that capital sets protected in the insurance scheme. So unless there is, you know, catastrophic damage from storms, um, the, the reinsurance market essentially absorbs the cost of this operation. So it is a financially sustainable uh, system. Uh, let's see, are you proposing that students take more classes on and diplomacy and finance in undergrad? Maybe not more, right? But maybe that fifth class in differential calculus might not be as useful as a class in statistics that was taught in the business school. That might be the space that I would be leaning into, Audra, in terms of how we would educate our students. Um, I think there's things that we have as part of our curricula that are really good from a mechanics point of engineering. Um, and it comes from the history of the field of engineering and, and how it developed. I might argue that some of the quantitative skills that we are giving environmental engineers are a little bit too much in the mechanics space. And we might benefit by moving a little bit more to the stochastic and statistics, epidemiology, risk assessment space. Uh, I'm not alone in suggesting that. Um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have engineers that still learn an entirely calculus-based curriculum. And I'm certainly not proposing that, 
that we would train environmental engineers to not know calculus. Um, but there are some parts of some of the quantitative skills that I, as an engineer and scientist, would say, as long as we're getting quantitative skills, they might be better served if they got a different mix of quantitative skills, um, particularly if they want to work in some of these spaces. So those would be some of the suggestions I would make. It's not, it's not the dumb down the curriculum. It's ask the question, what is the curriculum trying to accomplish? And if the purpose is make our students robust in quantitative skills, then knowing partial derivatives may not be as valuable as knowing some more macroeconomics or knowing linear algebra may not be as highly utilized as knowing statistics of, uh, of, of insurance. And so that's the space maybe that, that I would suggest we, we reevaluate as a field. Anything else? I think I managed to answer those questions. I think we're right at the time. Yeah, I think that's it, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, if you have any more questions, you can always email Dan. And um, if you would like any more information on becoming more involved in AAES, you can visit our website at aaes.org, or you can email me at mwaterman at aaes.org. And we have several more webinars planned, so check back with us. And if you haven't already, make sure to sign up for our mailing list on our website so you don't miss any upcoming webinars. This one will be um, posted on our website when we have the recording ready. That should be in the next few days. So you can always you know, go back and, and look at it, listen again. Uh, thank you so much. And that's all for today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all. Everyone Appreciate have a great day. Have a good one. Bye-bye.